uh, I want to talk on a little different t- topic today because a recent headline from a Capitol Hill newspaper declared that our con- current Congress could be the worst ever. Another said, negotiating political agreements is a lost art. The whole country knows something is wrong with our government. The problem is that senators are being prevented from doing their job. Common sense is ignored because bills are being made in a political vacuum. This results in more lengthy, complex, incomprehensible laws that defy logic. Former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi famously said that Congress would first have to pass a bill in order to find out what was in it. That's a problem. Legislation is often hundreds, if not thousands, of pages long. One bill could contain provisions affecting everything from health care to housing and increase the debt by hundreds of billions of dollars. I recently introduced a bill with Senator John Barrasso, also from Wyoming, that would take a page from Wyoming State Legislature's handbook. In order to stop Congress from passing bills with countless unrelated measures, Senate Resolution 351 would require any legislation considered by the Senate to be limited to a single issue. One topic per bill helps you to get things done. It means more understandable and manageable bills. This isn't a flashy concept, but I found people of both parties are receptive to it. It makes sense to them. Change is hard, and those who control the Senate now like the system we have. Most members of Congress have no opportunity to weigh in, and neither does the public directly or indirectly. This is a very tidy arrangement for those who are in power now, especially in the Senate. Nothing is approved unless the majority leader allows it to come up. Dissenting opinions are rarely considered. The majority, the majority leader uses procedural tactics to prohibit amendments to improve bills in order to control the legislation and to prevent his party from taking politically difficult votes. He's done this more than any other majority leader, perhaps more than all previous leaders. Political motivations and consolidation of power should not be used to deny senators from either party the right to represent their people. Last week, the majority leader used procedural tactics to prevent us from voting on tax amendments important to Wyoming, like a permanent state and local sales tax deduction amendment that was offered by my friend from the other side of the aisle, the senator from Washington. We were also prevented from voting on amendments that would be important to all of us, preventing waste of taxpayers' dollars by stopping the IRS from giving bonuses to the employees who haven't paid their taxes. Amendments were filed by members from across the country. By my count, more than 60 amendments to the tax package were filed by senators from the other side of the aisle. Nobody is being represented by amendments. At some point, we need to actually vote on the issues important to our constituents. And the members on both sides of the aisle who support these amendments need to insist on that. Last week, Politico's huddle claimed Senate GOP filibusters $85 billion tax extenders. But there's really no opportunity to filibuster when debates cut off before it ever begins. That's what the majority leader did by filing cloture on the tax extenders package. Cloture is a political tactic designed to bring debate to a close after a supermajority of the Senate is satisfied that a matter has received adequate consideration. In recent years, this majority leader has often filed a cloture petition immediately before any debate or amendments, not after adequate consideration. The number of same-day cloture filings has more than doubled compared to when Republicans last controlled the Senate. We aren't even being given a chance to debate, much less offer amendments. That's why I've joined Senator Grassley, Republican from Iowa, in co-sponsoring the End Cloture Abuse Resolution. It would amend the Senate rules to prohibit filing cloture until at least 24 hours of debate happen. Another telling statistic is the number of amendments the current majority has blocked from being considered in the Senate. As this chart shows, In 2005 and 2006, the Senate voted on almost 700 amendments on the Senate floor. Since the Senate's been controlled by the current majority, the number has dwindled. 
in 2011 and 2012 was about 350. Since July of last year, the majority leader has allowed votes on only nine Senate Republican amendments. In the House, where debate's very limited, very controlled by the majority, in the House, they had 132 votes on Democrat minority amendments. Let's see, the minority here had nine, where it's supposed to be an open debate, the cooling saucer for the country. In the House, always controlled by the majority in a very strict way with the Rules Committee, they got 132 Democrat minority votes on amendments. This majority preventing waste of taxpayers' dollars by stopping the IRS from giving bonuses um, doesn't get to come up. That's just one example of many, many things that happen on this. Um, now, the leader has used a tactic called filling the amendment tree to prevent amendments. In the last eight years, he's used this tactic 86 times. And we're still counting, of course. Um, that's in comparison to the last six majority leaders combined who only filled the tree 40 times. What's filling the tree? It's that political tactic of setting up a few amendments that cannot be taken down, have to be voted on before the bill can be done, and then filing cloture so that even those can't be done. 86 times and still counting. Six previous leaders, 40 times. Now, <clears throat> filling the amendment tree has become a routine way to prevent any senator, majority or minority, from exercising their right to offer an amendment because once the tree is filled, no senator can offer an amendment. Almost half of the Senate has been here less than six years. Yes, 45 of the 100 senators are in their first term. They don't realize that there's a better way. They haven't seen how it could work, how it did work, how it should work. I know how this can hurt. Uh, I once had a bill that would have been the first step of 10 for solving health care in this country. And it was small business health plans. It would have allowed small businesses across the country to join together through their association to get a big enough block to effectively negotiate with the insurance company or probably to set up their own insurance, self-insurance pool. Now, the majority leader when that was willing to bring it up and then filled the tree, filed cloture. I had two people that would have made the 60 votes necessary to get that over that each had one amendment to the bill. It would have been good amendments. And they weren't allowed to do their amendments. And consequently, I wound up just short of being able to pass a very important bill that would have brought down health care costs for this country and uh, might have encouraged people to do the other nine steps in the plan that Senator Kennedy and I had put together and uh, provided more in the way of insurance than what we've got now, and it would have been paid for. But committees should have the first opportunity to shape legislation. It's there that members are able to iron out unintended consequences and craft better legislation before it goes to the floor. Yes, there's a lot of flexibility in the committee process. You used to sit down and go through all of the amendments. There might be 200 on a bill that we were working on. And we'd put them into piles according to what they covered. And then we'd look and see who was involved in that particular pile and send that bipartisan group off to come up with a solution to these multiple solutions that had been presented. And they were usually able to craft something out of that and bring it back as another amendment that would make the bill better, eliminate unintended consequences, and perform a real service for our country. Um, most of the bills now don't go to committee first. Um, but after, after a bill goes to committee, then it would come to the floor. They come to the floor now. But all 100 members of the Senate should have an opportunity to improve the legislation. The reason we have so many people in Congress, 100 here and 435 on the other end of the building, is so that we have 535 different backgrounds that can, <coughs> pardon me, that can suggest improvements to bills, that know something from their background about something that others may not have noticed. That's why we do amendments. Rarely is that happening in today's Senate. More often than not, 
Committees are ignored and massive legislation is the result of a few people behind closed doors deal-making for the more than 535 members of Congress. We need to get away from deal-making and start legislating again. That's, an, that's apparent especially in our spending. Congress's job is to decide how much federal government should spend and on what priorities. That isn't being done under the Senate's current management. Deals are made. In fact, last January, the one that we voted on was a deal between one member of the House and one member of the Senate. You know how many amendments we got on that? Nobody got an amendment to it. The debate was really limited. It was one and one tenth trillion dollars spent on one vote put together by two people. That's deal making. That's not legislating. That's what's costing this country so much money. That's what stifles things. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had a bill that, that would actually was allowed amendments, and in two days, we covered the amendments and passed the bill almost unanimously because it had been improved significantly. That's what we need to get back to. We spend more time negotiating to not have amendments than it would take to vote on 75 amendments on a bill. Yes, a lot of them would fail. That, that's typical. But at least a senator can feel that his constituents have been heard. He just didn't have the votes for it. But they've been heard, and that's what we're missing right now. We are not getting to cover the amendments, and they can be covered relatively quickly. So deals are made, then spending bill, bills are all packaged into one massive take-it-or-leave-it bill, and the deficit's increased. In 2013, the Senate didn't pass a single appropriations bill. There are 12 of them we're supposed to do, starting right after April 15th. Uh, we didn't do any of them. We only considered one of the 12 bills on the floor, and that one was shut down because the First Amendment the majority leader didn't like. So he pulled it off of the floor. He never brought it up again, nor did he bring up any other spending bills. Is it any wonder that in January 2009, the total federal debt stood at $10.6 trillion, and now it's over $17 trillion? We don't budget. We don't appropriate. We just deal-make. It's never risen so high so fast in our country's history. Just like keeping legislation to one topic per bill, we should look at each spending bill individually. The committee should be able to look closely at each branch, each agency. That's how it used to work before the power shift. But we can make some changes now to encourage more spending scrutiny. We could switch to a biennial appropriations process. That means once every two years for each agency. I've introduced S-625, the Biennial Appropriations Act, and I'm also co-sponsoring Senator Johnny Isaacson's version of that legislation. My biennial budgeting bill would require the president to submit a two-year budget resolution at the beginning of each Congress. Congress would then adopt a budget resolution. Following adoption of a budget resolution, Congress would focus on appropriations bills. Each Congress would debate the defense appropriations bills. However, the other appropriations bills would be split into two groups. The more controversial bills would be debated on the first year after an election. And the six easy ones would be done the year before an election. Of course, the bill would mandate at least one joint oversight hearing with the Authorization Committee and the Appropriations Committee in the off appropriations year for those particular bills. When you're spending a trillion dollars, that's so much money that nobody can look at the details. Um, I don't even remember the last time we looked at something as small as a billion dollars, let alone a million dollars. And a million's a lot of money out where I live. We've got to get back to where we can have some scrutiny on the appropriations not a one-time deal. Uh, Congress has 535 elected representatives. When each of us looks at every proposal, lots of viewpoints and experience get put into the decisions we make for our country. But if all the decisions are made by the majority leader, the vast majority of Americans get shortchanged. Shortcuts are taken, committees are skipped, Legislation is long, and legislation is cumbersome, and it's not easily read, and it's not easily understood. 
if you skip all the process where you get to do that, then spending will reach all-time highs and we'll get less for our money. That has to change. These are some ideas on how we can solve those problems. We won't change unless those who are here exercise our rights. That may not happen until those outside Washington demand it. Demand that these and other ideas get considered. Demand your senators be allowed to represent you.